as far as the polls go, a lot of people are seeing the polls for the presidential election. We're electing the entire House. We're electing one third of the Senate. So I, what I wanted to go get into with you is the polls for the Senate and the House. And what I'm going to do, Rick. So, Rick, here is the Cook political report. And as you and I discussed before the show, Cook is on the liberal side of things. They like lean liberal. But these are the facts. The, the fact is there are currently in the Senate 48 Democrats, 49 Republicans, but three independents in the Senate. Those three independents caucus with the Democrats. They lean liberal. So that's the makeup of the Senate right now. Okay, you got 48 Democrats, 49 Republicans, and three independents. Now, one third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years. Now, this election just happens to be that there are 23 seats that are held by Democrats that are up for election. And what you're looking at now is on the far left side, you have a list of the senators and the open seats that are solidly Democrat. Next to that, likely Democrat. Next to that, lean Democrat. In the middle, toss up. Then on the right side, you have lean Republican, likely Republican, solid Republican. Now, Rick, what I'm looking at now is that solid Republican seat all, all the way in the far right. That's the West Virginia Joe Manchin seat. And the last time I looked, that Republican was up by 30 points. Right. So that's a pretty safe seat. Yeah, the Republicans are going to pick up West Virginia. I don't think anybody's doubting that, which makes the gives the Republicans 50 votes in the Senate. If nobody, no other incumbents lose, no other incumbent candidates end up getting, you end up switching the party in terms of who's in control of the state. So that West Virginia seat alone creates a 50-50 Senate if nothing else happens. All right. And also we have leaning look, the tester suite uh, seat in Montana. So if you add those two, you got 50... That gives the Republicans 51 seats. Now, if we elect Donald Trump and we get J.D. Vance as the tiebreaker in the Senate, albeit a slim margin, Republicans, if they can stick together, and that's a big question, if they can stick together, Republicans will take the Senate. Now, I wanted to talk with you about, because you have some great information about these toss-ups. You got four toss-up seats. You got one in Michigan. In Ohio, you have the Brown seat. In Pennsylvania, you have the Casey seat. And in Wisconsin, you have the Baldwin seat. What's your take on these four races, Rick? These are Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin are in uh, what are called swing states on the presidential election. And so a lot of money is being spent on both sides. And these elections are coming down to to Trump against Harris in many respects. It is a oh, there isn't there are split ticket voters, but it's ultimately a challenge for the Democrats in these states because Trump has the momentum on the presidential level. In Michigan, the incumbent retired and a longtime Democrat member of Congress with a record is run, is running for that seat. So she's actually got the is filling the incumbent role to some extent because she has a record. Of course, the Republicans running against her is Mike Rogers, who also has a record as a former member of Congress. And that's a battle royale right now. In terms of Ohio, President Trump's up significantly in Ohio. And it is a and JD Vance is his home state. And Sherrod Brown has been running around as if he's Donald Trump. But he's one of the more liberal members of the uh, US Senate. And he's been trying to pretend that he's Donald Trump's best friend because he and he's talking about issues like trade. He's talking about issues like tariffs. And he's saying he's got commercials on the air saying, I support Donald Trump's plan for on tariffs on China and things like that. I, I'm not sure tariffs was the issue, but he's got it ads up talking about him supporting Donald Trump's agenda. Now, if that doesn't happen unless Donald Trump is going to swamp Harris in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not a big surprise, but he's trying to avoid that, that tsunami taking him out with a, a young, really aggressive candidate who's underfunded, of course, because the Republicans seemingly always are, um, trying to hang in and trying to uh, to ride the Trump wave in Ohio. 
and bring another seat into the fold. You've got Pennsylvania with, with uh, Casey. Bob Casey's dad was a icon in Pennsylvania. He crossed party lines. He was a, he was pro-life, aggressively pro-life because he's Catholic. And he Casey's actually followed, not though. And but Casey Jr. is riding on his dad's reputation for has been for 12 years as he has been a, a progressive lapdog and hasn't he, there's he never stands up against the against the left. He ne- he's no longer a vote on abortion that that is anything but the same as Kamala Harris. And as a result, he's but he's trying to pretend and coast along on his dad's reputation. And that race, he's running against a, a guy named McCormick. It's a, and that's a race that's going to be a, a nail biter. Uh, McCormick is is not a Trump rep- Republican. Uh, he did run in, for the primary two years ago and barely lost to uh, Dr. Oz. Uh, but he is a, uh, but he's a he's fits into the mode of a lot of the old style Pennsylvania Republicans, the Hugh Scotts and the, those kind of people. So that's who he is. That's a race that's going to that is. It's going to be decided a week and a half after the election when they finish counting all the mm-hmm. ballots, and hopefully those ballots aren't from Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. The Wisconsin seat, Tammy Baldwin, is, a, I think, a three-term incumbent. She was the first lesbian elected to the Senate, which was her claim to fame. Big Emily's List uh, in Dorsey, so she's really heavy on the abortion issue. And with the emphasis by Kamala Harris on abortion, that's going to be one of the key issues in Wisconsin, will be that issue as a dividing line. The state is a 50-50 state. They have same-day registration, which means people can come in from Illinois after they've already mm-hmm. voted and register in the in Dane County, which is Milwaukee, and then vote again in Milwaukee. There's a lot of problems with things like that in Wisconsin, yep. which has a reputation as a clean state. But the fact of the matter is, is it's there are a lot of things that haven't been able to get done because the thing that's common between Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin is they all have Democrat governors. And secondly, they all have Democrat secretaries of state. Mm -hmm. And those of us who watched what happened four years ago know how important those two things are. So that is, and in Wisconsin, by the way, the Democrats spent about $45 million Mm -hmm. about six months ago to elect the deciding vote on the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So they spent about $40 $40 million on that. The Republicans spent two, because as typical, the Republicans had a fight over who was gonna be the nominee and the guy who the money people wanted didn't win. And so they they took their money and went home. And so the Republican who won got shot out on dollars and couldn't compete. Got outspent 40 to two. So that's a so the Demo- in Wisconsin the Democrats hold control of the state Senate or state Supreme Court as well, which is extremely significant. So that's your that's those four states. And uh, let's look at the lean D right now because one of them is Arizona, and the Republican yeah. candidate is Carrie Lake. Yeah. And I think that polls are drifting to her favor. Not that she's in the lead, but she's coming up in those polls. And also the Nevada seat is the Rosen seat. Uh, She's going up against a guy by the name of Brown, who is a veteran. And uh, again, both Arizona, both the Nevada uh, swing states. Donald Trump is doing well in Arizona. Uh, He's just slightly behind in Nevada from what we're told. Of course, we always know that Nevada, you've got about 10 percent voter fraud. That's always going to go Democrat there. But how do you see those races, Rick? I I think Sam Brown, the the nominee in Nevada, he's not only a veteran, he's a veteran. He's a disabled veteran who his face caught on fire in in war and he he bears the scars of war. And it's a, it's a reminder that he's sacrificed for this country in ways most of us can't imagine. Right. So he's a very powerful candidate. He's not he wasn't the most conservative candidate who was vying for the nomination, but he did in fact he got the nomination and he's running a credible race. And once again, Nevada often comes down to what happens in Clark County, which is Nevada, which is Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And a second factor in Nevada is the Democrats are very good at registering the students at UNLV, University of Nevada, Reno, and turning them out whether or not they live in Nevada or not. And so they're pretty good at doing that. And the rest of the state's going to have to overcome. Trump has a, has a competitive advantage here because his no tax on tips yeah. appeals to the culinary workers. All group, those casino workers. And the casino in workers. Las Vegas. And, and, that is a, and that is a huge market and voting block. And so it's a so he's Trump's no tax on tips has a real impact 
on the ability of the unions in, in Clark County to deliver the votes that they plan to deliver. Because quite honestly, folks, having no tax on tips makes a massive difference for somebody who's basically counting their salary in quarters and ones. So that's right. a, a big deal. Arizona. Let's put it. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Arizona. Yeah, Arizona. Carrie Lake started out slow. She's been, she spoke, everybody was focused on the fight. And so she was focused on that. And she got got put into a box because of that a little bit. Um, now, when people are finally paying attention, they realize the person she's running against is a radical liberal who's not somebody who they can depend on to be represent them. And Carrie Lake is making a pretty significant comeback. The last I saw, she was down by three points. I've seen polling that shows Trump anywhere from plus one to plus five in Arizona. Right. And the turnout effort, let me put it this way, this time in Arizona, the, the polling places in Maricopa County won't be so hot that they, the machines don't work anymore. And mm -hmm. so that kind of voter suppression activity that occurred this two years ago will not occur this year. So- Well, Rick, I'm looking at, I'm looking at these lean D and these toss ups. If Donald Trump gets three of the six, that gives the Republicans 54 C4 seats in the Senate. So now we're getting a little bit of margin here. Now, let's get a break in because on the other side, I wanna talk about the Republicans in the House races and how that may uh, end up. But as it is now, if the Republicans take the two, the two Senate seats that are leaning that way now and pick three of the six of the seats that are toss ups or slightly leaning Democrat, they got a 54, a 54 and seat every majority in the House. They'll need every one of them to pass it to get Trump's appointments in because you've got Lisa Murkowski who was in Alaska who was elected by Democrat votes because of their, their ranked choice voting. So she's dependent, she is relying on the Democrats and for her victory and for her being in the Senate. You've got Susan Collins who will be up for election. It will be difficult to get. And so you're looking right there, you're going to be down to really functionally 52. And you've got challenges with the Tom Tillis from North Carolina. You've got challenges with a lot of these different Republicans. So you need 54 to know you can have 51. And that's right. a, and so 54 really is the magic number from my perspective of whether Trump has a governing a majority in the Senate or if he's got a, a majority that's tepid. And I know you have to get to 60 in the Senate, but the first thing you have to do is get to 51 or right. 50 with the, with the vice president. And so that's the, so the thresholds. 54 is, in my mind, 53, 54, the minimal threshold for having the ability to say, I'm going to be at 50 on any issue I need to be on. Be Let's see if you'll have the uh, house after this break. And you are listening to him watching Conservative Commandos with Rick Manning. I'm Rick Trader. And today's show, like each and every one of our shows, is being brought to you by the First Amendment. It's also protected by the Second. And welcome back. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos radio show with Rick Manning and yours truly, Rick Trader. Coming to you from the MyPillow Studios, the MyStore Studios of the AUN TV network. We've got a couple of great guests that will be joining us today. One is Grover Norquist for Americans for Tax Reform. Also, George Parry, who is a former prosecutor in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. George is going to be talking about the submerged Republican vote. And Grover Norquist is going to talk with us about, guess what, taxes. So we got a couple of great guests. Rick Manning in the first segment. Today, we talked about the prospects, the polls of what could possibly happen in the U.S. Senate 